You're listening to a Frequency Podcast Network production. There aren't a lot of Monday afternoon speeches in the House of Commons that make national security and intelligence experts gasp. This was one of them. The Prime Minister alleging, essentially, an assassination in Canada by a foreign government will tend to do that. It will also raise a whole whack of questions, each of them more urgent than the last. If our government's allegations are true, and India is indeed behind the murder of a Sikh activist in BC, what does it say about the state of Canada's national security? Why might India think it could get away with this? How can we claim this country can protect its citizens who may be expats and dissidents disliked by their former countries? And if those former countries feel that they can kill Canadian citizens on Canadian soil, what exactly are we going to do about that? I'm Jordan Heath-Rawlings. This is The Big Story. Jessica Davis is the president and principal consultant at Insight Threat Intelligence. She's one of Canada's leading national security experts. Hey, Jess. Hi, it's nice to be here. Thank you for coming back on the show uh, during what I guess is a chaotic time for people who uh, analyze these kinds of things. Absolutely. I've done a few media hits today. (laughs) I can imagine. Well, listen, I will get my... uh, layman question, or my most layman question, out of the way first. When the announcement happened yesterday um, and Prime Minister Trudeau said, you know, we have credible intelligence that uh, India did this, how big a deal was that in national security terms? It was really quite astonishing. So me and a number of other security analysts were all pretty much floored by the announcement. It's pretty rare to have any kind of foreign interference actually attributed to a state. It is exceptionally rare, maybe the first time ever that it that it happens in the House of Commons. Wow. So I really can't emphasize what a big deal it was, you know, to have the prime minister stand up in front of all of Canada and say, this is what we believe happened. What exactly is the government alleging took place? How detailed is the information? So far, the statements have been fairly high level. We don't have a lot of detailed information that they've released, but they're basically saying that they believe that the government of India was in some way connected to the murder of Nijar out in British Columbia. Now, he was a Khalistani activist. He had been wanted by the Indian government for some of his activities. So, you know, he was a known entity, known quantity for the government of Canada and certainly for the government of India. And so the government of Canada is is basically saying that we believe that he was murdered by the Indian government. And I'm not asking you to uh, speculate on this situation here, because obviously there are some things that that we won't know. But In general intelligence terms, what would lead a government to publicly make this kind of announcement? Like, how might they have gathered that evidence? What are we talking about is going on here? So what I I think is probably happening over the last, I guess, four or five months since since his murder was a parallel investigation. So Mm -hmm. basically, we would have had the murder investigation taking place in British Columbia, led by the RCMP. They're the police of, of jurisdiction there. But... We already know, or we believe, that CSIS, Canadian Security Intelligence Service, actually warned Nijar ahead of time that they were concerned about credible threats to his life. That's what I believe his lawyer told Stuart Bell at Global News. So there's already a very high level of awareness about potential threats and and this individual. So what ends up happening is, so the murder takes place, and then that that investigation's happening, and then CSIS is probably conducting a separate investigation, not necessarily into the murder, but into the foreign interference aspect, Um, because CSIS doesn't have a mandate to investigate murders. It's all about threats to the security of Canada. And a foreign state conducting an extrajudicial killing or a targeted assassination in Canada on Canadian soil is absolutely a threat to the security of Canada. So what that ends up looking like is that they're looking for essentially trying to determine whether or not this killing can be attributed to a particular state, uh, in this case, India. The information or rather intelligence that they would have been collecting to do that would have come from their usual authorities. 
So this would have been human source collection, intelligence from other Canadian intelligence organizations like the Communication Security Establishment who do our signals intelligence, uh, potentially FinTrack, our financial intelligence unit, Mm -hmm. and a whole bunch of other folks. It could have also come through other forms of collection. They have something called Section 16 collection, which allows them to conduct foreign intelligence in Canada. Um, And then also it could have come from uh, partners. So we have a very close intelligence sharing relationship with the United States, the United right. Kingdom, the Five Eyes, as we like to refer to it. So that's where all of that intelligence could have come from. And some of it probably also came from the RCMP themselves through the murder investigation. How does, and we're going to get to the big time implications of this uh, in a moment, but how does a state even go about uh, carrying out an assassination on foreign soil, like just contemplating it. I'm not trying to to make light or, or draw strange comparisons in any way, but it, it really does sound like something out of a spy thriller to imagine that a, a foreign government could pull something like this off on the ground in Canada. So we unfortunately have a very public precedent that we know exactly how this happens in some countries. So with the murder of Jamal Khashoggi, a a hit team was deployed to lure him into an embassy where he was ultimately dismembered. I'll I'll, I'll avoid any more of the details on that story because it's really grim and, and people can look it up. But basically, a country can deploy a hit team to another country to, to conduct a targeted assassination. And, and to be fair, this does happen. There's a really excellent book by Ronan Bergman called Rise and Kill First, and it's all about Israeli targeted assassinations. Hmm. In this case, we obviously don't have any details about who might have been hired or employed to conduct the assassination, but you can use your imagination once you've read that book to, to see all of the different possibilities. To move towards the big picture implications, why or how would India feel able to do such a brazen thing, if indeed that's what they've done. It's really important when we think about India's potential actions here to realize a targeted assassination is not a country's first step in a foreign interference. This is not where they start. Hmm. This is sort of the absolute escalation, the the furthest they can really go um, in terms of foreign interference. Where it starts is with much lower level activities, intimidating diaspora communities, and in India's case, intimidating the Sikh community, seeking to interfere in those activities, potentially electoral interference. All of those kinds of things are the proving ground, if you will, for foreign interference for states. So they start at those kinds of activities that have lower stakes. Mm -hmm. And in very rare cases like this one, they escalate to a targeted assassination. What kind of implications does that have for the recent uh, allegations and discoveries and uh, inquiry uh, that we're having around foreign interference in elections? I mean, that was centered on on China specifically, but there was a question even back then of, of how broad should this be? Well, I think the first thing that these allegations do is really silence the China-only crowd. Mm. There has been a segment of Canadian population that really wanted the foreign interference probe to focus exclusively on China. That was misguided. Myself and many other security analysts have been very vocal that there's a lot more foreign interference going on in Canada than just from China. You know, we can talk about India, Iran, China, Saudi Arabia, uh, Russia, to name five just off the top of my head. Hmm. The inquiry, which starts today, really needed to, needs to go quite a bit further than just looking at China. That's not going to solve our problems just by focusing on one country. So this incident really does demonstrate concretely that this probe needs to be much broader than just China, as it is, as, as the government has already set, set up in terms of its terms of terms of reference. Is this a failure of our national security at the highest level? I don't mean to ask that as a leading question. I know it must sound that way, but I'm trying to get a sense of if there was any way this could have been seen coming and stopped, if this tells a broader story when combined with interference about whether we are able or not to protect ourselves from foreign meddling. I think it's really worthwhile whenever there's an incident like this, whether it's a terrorism incident, I mean, in this rare, this case, uh, you know, allegations of a targeted assassination, to consider them in the context of potential intelligence failures. The harsh reality is, is that 
a Canadian citizen was murdered in Canada and we weren't able to stop it. So that, to a certain extent, is an automatic failure. Hmm. Whether or not expectations of law enforcement and security services being able to stop that are reasonable, I think, are a different question. In my view, I think we need to hold them to that standard. I want to live in a country where political dissidents can come and express their views without fear of being murdered Mm -hmm. by their home state. I think that's a very reasonable aspiration and one that I actually think that our law enforcement and security services can live up to. The problem then comes in terms of whether they've got the right tools and the right resources to be able to do that. And this is certainly an issue right now. In terms of the tools, there's a number of things that we need to put in place to make sure that CSIS and the RCMP can do their job. But those things are things like foreign agent registries, hmm. beneficial ownership registries, all things that really tighten up Canada's framework for countering foreign interference. But then there's the resources issue. And while I'm often one to talk about needing to give CSIS and the RCMP more resources, that they need to be better used, I think the reality is right now, both of those organizations are suffering serious recruitment problems with really high vacancy rates. So the problem then becomes, do they actually have the staff on hand to deliver on their required programs. And I worry that this might be evidence they don't. How worried should Canadians who hold unpopular opinions in other countries be right now? And here we, you know, we could talk about Falun Gong or or the Uyghurs or a lot of people from Iran, but I'm trying to get a sense of, you know, is is, this is obviously an extraordinary one-off, but what does it say about our ability to protect those people? Well, we certainly hope it's an extraordinary one-off. I don't think that anybody in any diaspora community that has views that their their home country finds offensive or objectionable needs me to tell them that they're in danger. Did they feel that way before this? Like, what was the sense of security before this happened? Absolutely. Every person from every diaspora community that I've ever spoken to from any of those countries that I mentioned earlier have all expressed serious concerns about foreign interference, either, you know, cyber or intimidation, concerns about threats for their family at home, all of these different kinds of things. That's what they tell me. That's what I've heard from them. Um, And I think that this is one of the things that's going to be really important at the inquiry is to hear this evidence from these communities about what exactly is happening and what they think is happening, what they can prove is happening, what our intelligence services can shed light on. All of those things are going to be really important. How do we reassure those people that we can protect them? Um, What do we need to do and and how do we change that? Can we right now, I guess? Well, that's exactly it, right? So I think that if we were to try to say that we're going to be able to protect dissident groups, uh, diaspora communities, I I don't think that we'd be taken very seriously, Hmm. just given what we've seen very recently um, and over the last couple of years. Canada has... I don't want to be too harsh on this, but I do want to be rather clear. We haven't taken foreign interference as seriously as we should have. We haven't prioritized it. We haven't done the things that we need to do to really keep people safe in Canada. And I think that's the unfortunate reality of where we're at right now. So, you know, part of this whole foreign interference inquiry, I hope, is going to be about identifying gaps in legislation, gaps in regulations, tools that the RCMP and CSIS need to better keep Canadians safe, but it's going to be a bit of a hill to climb. It's funny how I can look back on the escalation of the importance of foreign interference just in the general, I guess, Canadian consciousness. You know, we've been doing this for five years. Um, One of our earliest episodes, our first one with Stephanie Carvin, who I believe uh, you know, was about just the aspect of China buying up Canadian businesses and how that constituted foreign interference. And then we progressed from that to larger things, to election interference, and now to like extrajudicial killings on Canadian soil. And it boggles my mind how I guess this has kind of been happening in plain sight. Yeah, absolutely. So our our security services and law enforcement have been looking at this for decades. They, They know what's going on. They know what's happening. Right. I think the difficult thing here is trying to explain to Canadians what's happening. And keep in mind, too, that a lot of this activity really ramped up during the early years of 
or the mid years, I would say, of the global war on terrorism, when we were really focused on that counterterrorism mission. You know, rightly so, it, it was an immediate threat. There was immediate concerns, threats to life, all of those kinds of things. But we failed in that we didn't broaden out the conversation around national security issues to include foreign interference until it was really kind of too late. Hmm. So it's great that you had 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 my good friend Stephanie Carvin on talking about those investments, because that's one of the things that's been very difficult to explain to Canadians about is about how this can pose a threat to the security of Canada, because it's so soft, like it's so, it's quite intangible right. in, in some ways, whereas like, you know, terrorism is, is very easy, you understand that immediately. And the foreign interference and espionage threat is really a strategic long-term threat, whereas the terrorism threat is a bit more of a tactical sort of immediate threat. And you know, in Canada, we just really haven't had a great culture of talking about national security issues. That's changing, but it's taken some pretty catastrophic events to change that. We like to believe that everything is fine and we're Canada and, and we sort of, the other countries don't bother with doing us like that, I think. Like, I'm speaking for the public consciousness here, not obviously for people who really pay attention to this stuff. Yeah, and I think the thing that I would like to tell Canadians about that is that we have a way of life. We have economic and financial resources and, and natural resources and land and water that other people want. Mm -hmm. We are a safe haven for opinions and beliefs that, that a lot of other countries find threatening. So that all of those things makes us a target. So if we want to protect all of those things, and I think that we do because they're super important and, and they're really what create Canada and and create our wealth and economic prosperity, then we have to really be taking these things seriously. I will ask you, you know, now that we are presumably taking things uh, much more seriously than we have in the past, what options do we have for retaliation in this case? I know a uh, top diplomat has already been kicked out and India has done the same, which is also what we did in, in the case of Chinese election interference. In that case, it kind of felt maybe retaliatory. In this case, it kind of feels like woefully inadequate. Yeah, the unfortunate reality is that we don't have a lot of good options at this point. So we kicked out an Indian intelligence official, which is meaningful. It means that it's going to really compromise any information and intelligence sharing activities, which were probably already seriously compromised given the information that we, we know now. Mm -hmm. And that will chill that relationship. We can continue to talk about this on the international stage. You know, the United Nations General Assembly is happening today. I would be surprised if the Prime Minister raises it there, but there will certainly be conversations in pull asides with different nations, probably a lot of people expressing their sympathy with Canada and potentially also sharing their own experiences about foreign interference, India or otherwise. But the reality is, is India is a really big trading partner for us. We have to be cognizant of the other geopolitical complexities. You know, there's a bit of a different grouping of countries that are supporting Russia in the war in Ukraine. And we're, mm -hmm. you know, we're trying to sort of break that up a little bit, maybe bring India on side as much as we can. There's, there's a lot of complexities to this. And the reality is, is Canada just doesn't have the tools, or even if we did have the tools, there would be a certain element of cutting off our nose to spite our face if we were to take really serious action. The best I think we can hope for is potentially some criminal charges being announced, even if they're not, even if arrests aren't made, because my personal view is that I doubt that the gunmen in the Nijar murder are actually still in Canada. I think mm -hmm. that would be very strange if they were, but we can still announce charges with the possible view down the road of potentially getting justice for the victim. But this is this is a long-term project that we're in now. Over the next little while, will this issue be as political as the Chinese election interference issue has been? I know that at that time, uh, there was a ton of partisan blame being thrown around, specifically targeted uh, towards the government, obviously. Yesterday, after the prime minister's announcement, Pierre Polyev called for unity and said it's important that Canada stands together on this. Is that going to last if this is the long game? You know, I'm no, I'm no expert on uh, domestic Canadian politics and sort of those partisan politics, but I think that there's already evidence that that's not going to last. And to be fair, I actually don't necessarily want unity from the opposition party. 
I want them to be holding the government to account. I want them to be asking the hard questions because without them doing that, there's no incentive for the federal liberals to be sharing more information. So Mm. they've got a really important role to play here, which is to really push the government to be more transparent, to make changes, to do the things that need to be done to make Canada safer. Because without that push, I worry that, you know, the government could take the easy road and just try to sweep as much of it under the carpet as possible. I don't think that that's what's going to happen, but that's what the opposition's job is right now. The last thing I'll ask you is, what will you be watching for in the days and weeks, et cetera, to come? I mean that in two ways. First, in terms of, you know, uh, the actual questions we need answers to in terms of what happened, but also that will tell you if we are taking this seriously enough and making the kind of changes uh, that seem to be needed. The thing that I'm really looking for is further details about what happened. The other thing that's kind of interesting and related to that is that the government actually told us about this, about the, the allegations against India, because the information was already coming into the public domain is, is sort of what they descri- how they described it, mm-hmm. which to me says that there was there were leaks. There were people in government sharing this information with journalists, and this was going to come out one way or the other. So my, what I'm really looking for and wondering is if there's going to be further information leaked or whether the government's going to be more proactive and share a little bit more about the evidence that they have against India. Jessica, thank you so much for this. As always, um, it's incredibly complex. I feel like I understand it uh, a bit better now. I'm glad, and it was a real pleasure to talk to you. Jessica Davis of Insight Threat Intelligence. That was the big story, probably the first of several episodes surrounding this that we'll do over the next year, as whatever story we get eventually comes out. You can find more of the big story, including previous episodes with Jess Davis, and as I mentioned during the interview, that one with Stephanie Carvin, by heading to thebigstorypodcast.ca. If you'd like to talk to us to suggest a story idea, and especially if you have a story idea that pertains to navigating the economy in Canada right now, a struggle you're having, a question you have, anything that's making life difficult because of money, you can send it to us. We are always open to them. And you can find us on Twitter at TheBigStoryFPN, You can email us. The address is hello at thebigstorypodcast.ca. And you can call us and leave a voicemail. That number is 416-935-5935. You all know by now that The Big Story is available in every single podcast player. I hope you know by now that the best way you can help this podcast is by sharing it, rating it, reviewing it, and doing all of those good podcast world things. Thanks for listening. I'm Jordan Heath-Rawlings. We'll talk tomorrow.